I'm Michael, and welcome to Beyond the Screenplay, the podcast where each week we do a conversational deep dive analysis into a film. And this episode is a little different. So I'm joined by part of the Beyond the Screenplay team, Trisha Aran. Hello, everyone. And Brian Bittner. Hello, hello. Alex is out on vacation this week, so we thought we'd try something out. Uh, So we're going to do a series of weekly mini episodes on Loki for our patron supporters, uh, starting with this first episode covering the first two episodes of Loki. Uh, So this is kind of like the pilot of the series, and the rest will be exclusive to our supporters on Patreon. And then as far as the main podcast goes, we'll be back next week with our regularly scheduled programming um but so so we have these things called the marvel tv shows Uh now yep uh and so i kind of just want to start by getting your guys thoughts on them and then we can kind of dive specifically into loki because i think there are some really interesting things about loki to talk about as far as like genre goes and meta things and all that stuff but first i just want to get kind of like a quick hit on your feelings on wandavision and falcon and the winter soldier like which things you've watched and how you feel about this new world that we find ourselves in. Mm -hmm. Trisha, what do you make of all of this? Well, in a lot of ways, I think that I am probably the ideal Marvel viewer, which is to say that I don't think I've ever seen a Marvel thing that I didn't like or have fun with. Um, The stakes for me are pretty low. Like I'm not a massive fan of the comics or anything like that. And I didn't, really have any relationship with any of the characters from the Marvel universe up until I started watching the Marvel movies, you know, back with beginning with Iron Man. And so mm-hmm. my experience of them is that they're these big popcorn blockbustery things with these superhero stories and they're pretty good across the board. And so I'm pretty much going to have a good time. And that has been my experience with the TV shows. Also, I was like, I like this. I like Wanda. I like vision. I like old sitcoms. It's great. I'm here for it. Not a problem. I definitely enjoyed it. Lots of cool stuff. Catherine Hahn's amazing. Not a problem from me, you know? And I kind of felt the same way about Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Those were not two of my favorite characters by any stretch. But I was like, here's an action show. Look, they're doing action. They're, you know, being in the military and going around the world and there's all this fraught stuff about the shield and there's, you know, some (laughs) stuff about American history and, and how tricky that is to navigate as heroes. And I like that too. Okay. Like, and so that's also how I feel about Loki. I'm like, yeah, Loki, I like him. Look, I like everybody. (laughs) It's all fun. You know, none of this. I feel like people who have really close personal relationships with these heroes and they have high expectations, that is valid. Like if you grew up with these and these are your heroes and they are your Star Wars, right? Like Star Wars can make me really mad and sad and disappointed. (laughs) And uh, the MCU pretty much can't do that because I'm just kind of here as like a, I like big expensive movies that are well done and TV shows that also fall into that category. Yay, look at all the ones we have, (laughs) pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like I I kind of fall into that same boat, I think, where it's like I really enjoyed the MCU ultimately and got really into it, um, but never had crazy high expectations. And when I heard that they were going to do TV shows, it was sort of like, yeah, okay, I'll I'll probably watch it and like maybe it'll be good. Um, And so, yeah, I've I've overall enjoyed them as well. And I have some sort of like uh, thoughts about what it even feels like to be watching them that I want to get into a bit more because it's kind of unlike anything else. Um, But Brian, I want to hear from you. What are your thoughts on all of this? Uh, Yeah. Same, same general feeling about the MCU, which is just positive. And, and I'm not like the biggest fan. Like I'm, I feel like I, I personally am, am like sort of an outsider fan where I watch people screaming at, Avengers Assemble and that kind of thing. And I'm like, I love this for you. Um, But for me, (laughs) I'm just like having a really good time. And I've seen all the movies and I've also enjoyed them all. Um, So I really don't have anything negative to say about the MCU. And I'm always like, I'm always curious and interested and looking forward to whatever the next thing is. Um, Even if I'm not like scrambling on internet forums being like, oh man, I can't, you know, like the sort of somewhere in there. Um, 
And I was a big fan of the Netflix Marvel shows, Daredevil and Jessica Jones, Mm -hmm. um, that whole thing. And they were um, they were more my tone because they were more sort of dark and adult and they were a little more subdued, (laughs) partially Mm -hmm. because of of budget constraints. So it's like, you know, there's there's very little visual effects like the finale of i think season one of daredevil is daredevil jumping off a wall and punching someone in the face and i was like (laughs) finale (laughs) um and uh but i liked those and it was sad i was sad that they got canceled basically so that that you know marvel could do what they're doing now on disney plus um but that being said i do appreciate that they are saying let's take the MCU and sort of let's hold on to this brand so you don't get your ABC Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and you don't get your Netflix, this is dark and adult. You just get you, the thing you see in the movies, that's what you're going to see on Disney Plus also, and it's going to all sort of feel like the same thing. They get to be a little crazier with the shows. It's sort of, this is what we maybe wouldn't put in a movie. Um, but uh, but I do appreciate that it's like, we got the same actors. We have the same production. You know, we have mm-hmm. these like six to eight episode seasons that are sort of limited series. Uh, not, you know, they're not all even meant to be a continuing series. It just, mm-hmm. here's a here's a six hour story we had to tell, which means they could put the the budget basically of one of their movies into those, you know, four to six hours. And you really feel like you are watching something cinematic. Um, so so yeah, I've I've also enjoyed it. I'm a big Dick Van Dyke fan and uh Bewitched. I grew up watching those shows. So mm-hmm. not because I'm that old, but because I <laughs> watched a lot right. of Nick at Thank Night. You for as there was a thing yeah. called Nick at Night <laughs> yeah. kids. So. <laughs> um but yeah, I just I feel like the the six episode, six to eight episode format, it keeps the seasons from dragging. It allows yeah. for this big budget. It tells a focused story where each week something is happening and changing you know, the Netflix series were 13 hour long episodes. So you got Mm -hmm. a little in the woods, weeds, things. um, (laughs) Right. Lost in the woods. Right. Right. (laughs) Where where you're like, look, I'm entertained. I'm having a good time, but I'm just sort of waiting for like this thing to resolve. So the next thing can resolve. And when you're, you know, 45 minute episodes and there's only six of them, you really have to get things moving. And, um, and yeah, so I've really been enjoying it and I'm having, having a lot of fun with Loki so far. Yeah. I will say, I think Loki is probably the most fun. You know, the first couple mm-hmm. episodes of WandaVision were really fun, but they were channeling sitcoms and they right. were like aggressively trying to be sitcoms in a way that I thought was effective and really cool. Right. But you sort of weren't sure how you were supposed to feel. Yeah. <laughs> so it was like right. off-putting in a, in a way that it was <laughs> meant to do, you know, Loki, you're like, okay, I get it. This is uh-huh. like goofy time travel. Got it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I don't know where the rest of the series is going because there's plenty of dark stuff in Loki too, which we can get into. You know, it's mm-hmm. kind of a crime procedural murder right. thing. Um, but you know, between Hiddleston and and Owen Wilson here, there's so much that's just fun mm-hmm. to watch, and I love how this show looks. Like, yes. I, let's get into all of that. But anyway, just like the first couple episodes of this, I was like, oh yeah, like this is maybe the most. Uh, I don't know, like checks a lot of my boxes. It mm. has that mid-century design to it. And like, I love the bureau- bureaucracy, like nonsense of it and like what that would mean for the MCU. Right. Right. Yeah. This it's, this is the one of the three where you can kind of clearly see how mm-hmm. what's going to happen in this show is going to affect the movies and kind of ripple out. Um, and yeah, just, you know, to kind of quickly talk about WandaVision and Falcon. I, what was really interesting and that I liked about this approach is that it, it's kind of genius because it's sort of taking these characters that I would say, I would imagine aren't the fan favorites, right? They didn't get as much time in the movies um, as a lot of the other characters, you know, Wanda and Vision, like you see them and you kind of get a little bit of backstory uh, and Falcon and the Winter Soldier are definitely there, but there isn't a ton of character development. And so I like that they're using this format to make me care about characters or at least give me time to hang out with some of these characters in a way that I didn't get a chance in the movies. And so for both of those, it was these are four of my kind of least favorite characters Mm. from the films that by the end of the shows, I was like, oh, I feel there's like a a connection to them now. 
Loki is interesting because I feel like he's very much a fan favorite. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And so it is interesting, but kind of a different meta thing happening. Um, but I also like that they are kind of playing with genres and, you know, WandaVision is very clearly like tapping into all the sitcoms across all the decades and all that stuff. Falcon and Winter Soldier feels a bit less like it's doing a an interesting genre thing. Um, but I've definitely been getting uh, crime kind of Fincher Zodiac yeah. seven mm. vibes, but like with Tom Hiddleston and Owen Wilson, like you're saying, Trisha, and like what a funny pairing to mm-hmm. put into that. And it all clicked in the in the second episode where they give Loki the jacket, like the TVA yes, exactly. jacket. And it's like, oh, okay, we're going to do a detective story. Like, that's pretty fun. I'm excited about this. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, of, of all the actors I didn't expect to see in the MCU, we got Owen Wilson now. Wow. wow. Guy's crazy as a road lizard. <laughs> um, Sorry, he's so good at this. Uh, Owen Wilson. He really yes. is. He's doing it's, a lot of work. Yeah. I just love his delivery of lines he throws lines away constantly like he just throws them completely away or says them even when they're really pointed insults he almost says them in this like very compassionate way to loki yeah. um i i love the interpretation of the character here and the performance is so great like mobius is it would be easy to mess this character up mm. it would be easy to make him like care too much where he's like too intense in every scene it would be easy to make him like a little bit more self-aware where he's like wisecracking on purpose and i don't know yeah just i was th- i was re-watching the second episode today and when he's leaving ravona's office um and she's like one more thing and he's like i was almost gone like <laughs> as he was leaving right that way that he delivers jokes i don't Owen Wilson is just the perfect person for this role. And yeah, he and Tom Hiddleston have great chemistry. I feel like we also haven't seen Owen Wilson is like constantly working, but we haven't seen him in like a major role in a few years. Uh So I feel like this is like adult Owen Wilson now. Like, right. Right. (laughs) Like not just because. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. But but also his performance, it feels like it has sort of a a, um, understated quality to it that you don't always get. Granted, he's done dramatic roles and stuff like that. But in terms of like, what do you get when you put actor X in thing Y? You're like, oh, this is what I expect. And this is kind of like Owen Wilson being Owen Wilson, but also being like having a little bit more gravitas than usual. Right. Um, but yeah, real quick, as you were saying, Michael, about like, oh, this is this is like a genre thing. You know, it's a different thing. I think it, it was so ballsy to start with WandaVision as like, here's what the MCU is. And I don't know if that was a time constraint thing or if that was always their decision. Um, Mm. I think I heard actually that Falcon and Winter Soldier was supposed to be first. They announced that first and stuff too. So yeah. yeah. But I agree that WandaVision is, I'm glad it happened that way. Yeah. Right. But I think the, the interesting distinction here is WandaVision feels nothing like an MCU movie. It feels like we get to play with TV to make a TV thing. I mean, it does by the end. I would say like the final couple episodes, especially the finale, feels like an MCU movie. But even then, there's like a TV-ness to it, I would say, that like it it doesn't have like maybe the full cinematic thing. Whereas you look at Falcon and Winter Soldier, just that opening 12-minute scene or whatever is like, oh, this just feels like I'm watching an MCU movie. And I think there's nothing, it's not better or worse. Those are just two different ways of these, that these Mm -hmm. two different things these shows can do. They can either be an MCU movie told over six episodes, or they can be WandaVision or Loki where they're like, we're going to kind of Loki almost feels like it could be Ragnarok or guardians or something, but it still feels Mm -hmm. like it's, it's kind of its own thing that doesn't really exist in MCU movie world. Um, So yeah, it's interesting that they're right off the bat. They're giving us these playful experimental, like you are going to get your Falcon winter soldier, but we're also going to have some fun and do some genre things and and that kind of thing. So yeah, it's just, it's been interesting to see. Uh, what they're what they're doing and what the reactions are to it. Mm. Well, and I think it, there is you can feel that there's less like at stake for them, so they can play and they can be experimental mm. and they can go. You know, I think Falcon and Winter Soldier is the least experimental in terms of form, right? Um, Definitely. But story wise, you know, it goes into some like pretty intense, heavy places in terms of like what does it mean to be an African-American Captain America, like they they try Mm -hmm. to tackle all of that and are able to, you know, at least bring all these things to the table and discuss them in a way that they just wouldn't do in a movie that needs to play all over 
the world and and all that stuff right um so yeah but but there is this kind of thing that's kind of happening when i'm watching that's this meta thing where because it's so different it's not a movie but it's also not a normal tv show right. mm-hmm. like there's something else that occasionally i find myself watching thinking am i entertained like i think i'm entertained now <laughs> but i'm i'm in this kind of mode that i've never been in before where i'm just kind of watching because i know i need to keep watching and not not in like an obligation way not in a negative way um this is where alex would chime in if he were here um but there's just something about like i don't know the relationship that i have as a viewer with these shows that is unique that i've never felt before well, I wonder if you're experiencing some of the thing that I've been feeling when I'm watching them, which is I'm having like screenwriting structure like disorientation happening. Mm, yeah. Where yeah. W- I know where I am in a movie, like right. pretty much all the time. I know exactly where I am in a movie. I'm like, oh, look, there's the inciting incident. Oh, look, here's the break into act two. There's the midpoint. Not that I'm always consciously like tracking the structure when I'm watching, you know, a two hour movie, but I, I feel oriented in the form pretty mm-hmm. much all the time as a screenwriter and this sort of longer form, but very limited series storytelling and, you know, not in a big heavy drama and not in a very, episodic like every single episode is something totally different it's this weird hybrid of things where i think i know what the inciting incident of loki is and i think i know what the break into act two is and we're not at the midpoint yet next week probably right (laughs) like that's the third episode so probably but i'm with you where i feel i'm watching mobius and loki sit there and talk about you know time and the timekeepers <laughs> and what mm-hmm. existence is and existence is chaos and you believe you're here you, you know i believe this about uh, my purpose in life or whatever and i mean i'm enjoying seeing these two characters play off each other and i also really enjoy the you know detective story of it all but i don't know that i'm always like i understand what this beat means mm-hmm. right and even when the show is trying to tell me where it's like signaling to me, you know, especially in the last like third, I want to say the climax of the second episode where they're at the rocks cart and it's this, you know, set piece of Loki is fighting all the other Lokis and the, I'm sorry, the variants and mm-hmm, mm-hmm. weird. She has weird puppet skills. That's what she <laughs> does with her powers. Um, that's different than the Loki we know. Fine. But the show is trying to signal to me that this is a major turning point, but which turning point is it structurally it's a little bit hard to track with and know and so i think that's maybe that disorienting like feeling that you're describing michael of like i'm having fun i'm entertained but i don't know where i am yeah i think that's spot on yeah i think uh, thinking about some of the show a lot of the big shows from the past decade or so um we're sort of getting into this new place now with this format of, of the smaller, even Stranger Things or um, Jack Ryan or something like that, where it's basically like we are telling a movie over the course of several episodes, essentially. Um, whereas if you look back at like the AMC golden era of Breaking Bad, Mad Men, Walking Dead, it was like, yeah, there were bigger arcs and stuff, but each episode felt like a a standalone yes. thing, right? So you yeah. are watching like, okay, this is happening and it's going to happen and we're uh, right. characters are responding to it. And by the end of the episode, a thing has happened or not happened. And and now next week will be a, a new thing, even though, of course, there are these, these overarching, you know, arcs that are happening. And then um, Mandalorian came in and said, well, what if we just made every episode was sort of like a little adventure? Which I like that as a concept, except if it's like, well, at the end of this episode, nothing is different from the last episode, which is my f- problem with like the first part of the first season. And then the second season got a little better at being like, no, no, we are we are moving towards, a, you know, an end goal. But those episodes were also short. They were like 35 yeah. minutes, a lot of them. So I felt like mm-hmm. I'm, I felt like I'm really having a good time and I'm excited by this, but I feel like it's over. And then now I'm just sitting here wanting more, you know, and what I like about um 
uh, especially Falcon, Winter Soldier, and Loki. WandaVision was sort of formatted a little differently because of what the show was. But mm-hmm. uh, but these two shows is the episodes are a good 45, 50 minutes long. So I feel like I get a week's worth of stuff. But because it's a week's worth of stuff that's doing a overarching thing, the bigger story is taking six episodes. Then it's sort of where you guys are talking about where you're maybe lost a little in I'm not necessarily I don't know if I'm going to feel like complete at the end of this episode and excited for the next one or not. And I think they've done a pretty good job. Mm -hmm. Like the first episode ends with the variant we're hunting is you. And then the second one ends with him jumping into the the time thing and, you know, probably break into two. Right. Where it's like exactly point of no return. Um, So I think that we are getting those big those big beats and that kind of thing. But it's just a little different. I'm sort of glad, but I was wondering. I was wondering if the season was going to be like episode two, we're in this time period and we have to like do a little Doctor Who yeah, yeah, yeah. Star Trek <laughs> holodeck like adventure or something. And I'm glad it's not that because I'd rather they just tell like the full story. But um, but that's kind of if they did something like that, then it would feel like each episode was a standalone thing. Right. Mm-hmm. But I'm I'm more interested in them telling me a six part story, even if that means any individual episode may not be the most satisfying thing. I want to feel satisfied at the end when it's all over. Mm -hmm. Hello, listener. If you want to help support Beyond the Screenplay, one of the best ways to do it is by supporting the sponsors that support us. Our sponsor for this episode is one of our favorites, Mubi. Mubi is unique among all the streaming services because it offers a curated selection of exceptional films from all around the globe. Every day, Mubi premieres a new film, and each and every one of them is hand-selected. It might be a timeless classic, a cult favorite, or an acclaimed masterpiece. And you can try Mubi for free for 30 days at mubi.com slash beyond the screenplay. That's M-U-B-I dot com slash beyond the screenplay. The link is in the show notes. The team and I have talked about a few films that we've watched on Movie before, but we want to hear from you guys. So after you sign up and have checked out a couple films, tweet at the Beyond the Screenplay Twitter with the name of what you watched and your mini review of it. Then in a future movie spot, we'll talk about some of your favorites and read your review so other people can check them out. Mubi is a great way to expand your knowledge of cinema. So head to Mubi.com slash Beyond the Screenplay to get 30 days of great cinema for free and let us know what you watch. Thanks to Movie for sponsoring Beyond the Screenplay. Yeah, it's it's interesting because it, you know as you were talking, I was thinking about like True Detective and True Detective. Mm-hmm. You know, season one is you know a you know a single narrative, right? It has a, its own arc, but also every episode feels like a whole meal unto itself. And so it's kind of doing right. both, where it's like each episode you feel like you've just gone through a whole story but it's also just another chapter in this bigger story. And I think the way that it's able to handle both of those things is partially why it's so amazing. Um, and Mayor of Easttown, which I've talked about before and mm-hmm. ended recently, is also great and, and does that not as elegantly, but also manages to do that. But I do think what is interesting about these Marvel shows is that it, they kind of have put in each world where like sometimes the episode is a full story unto itself, but sometimes it feels like it's more concerned about setting up the bigger journey that you're going to go on almost as if it were literally a big movie. And I'm mostly just curious to see how these mature, because it seems like we're going to keep getting these for a while. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder if they're going to kind of arrive at a new language and a new kind Mm. of form and our expectations will kind of adjust to to fit whatever these things are. Because there are moments where it feels like it's really working like Trisha, you pointed out, you know, the, the finale, or I guess it's almost like the second half of the episode is, you know, in that crazy supermarket. There are moments where it feels like, oh, this is like a fun TV show I'm watching. And then there are moments where it's like, oh, this is like an action scene kind of maybe in the middle of a movie where mm-hmm. I'm not that invested because I know it's going to happen. And so we're kind of just getting through it. And it feels like they're kind of switching modes. And I want to see if they're going to average out into something just new that they can... Uh, like reliably stay on in terms of storytelling form. Mm -hmm, Right. Yeah. So the first episode, as you pointed out, I think in the discord, we were chatting about this um, with some patrons and just a bunch of us, we have a 
Marvel Cinematic Universe, just like <laughs> channel in the Discord that's like whatever the new Marvel thing is, we're talking about it. And so right now it's all Loki all the time. Um, but I think you pointed out, Michael, that we like the first episode feels just really exposition heavy. Yeah. Which again, in a full length movie, we kind of don't mind that, you know, having some front loaded exposition. We're also hoping for some exposition sprinkled throughout, but it's really front loaded in Loki. Now, fortunately, the TVA is so interesting mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the characters, the people that inhabit that world are so fun and interesting. And it's so like enjoyable to watch Loki squirm and try to figure out how he's going to get out of there or bluster his way through it. Um, that we don't mind that we're basically just sitting or standing in rooms, <laughs> hearing people tell us information, right? No, right. Like, which is such a testament to the writing that you basically have an entire first episode of a show that is Loki wanders through a series of rooms and people tell him stuff. And yet we're still so entertained by that. So hats off to that. Um, but then the second episode does feel like, I, you know, I didn't do an actual breakdown on it, but it does feel like it meanders structurally. Um, yeah. Yeah, just to sort of reinforce what we're saying, I wonder, like, I don't know what the next episode is going to be. Like, mm -hmm. you have all of this Ren fair stuff. You know, they go to Pompeii and they, like, <laughs> do that whole thing, which is just a fun detour. But even even that sequence in the, the Rocks cart, you know, Superstore, it feels like it's not a manufactured climax, but I got a little bit of the feeling that you have of the mode switch where it's like, now we're going to have a fight. Um, and we're already going to confront the villain, too. Right. Which is really early on or would be really early on if this were, uh, you know, a feature length movie, because we're not even at the midpoint yet. We've already mm -hmm. met the villain in real life. So, right. Yeah, I'm I'm so curious. Yeah. Well, and I, I feel like this I was thinking about kind of the, the genre aspect of it also of it was the second episode where, I, like I mentioned, I was kind of able to settle into, OK, this is a, a detective story with. Owen Wilson and Tom Hiddleston, like Loki as a detective and, the, you know, the killer out there is himself and he's got to catch that. And so once that clicked, I was like, oh, cool. Now I know what the show is and I can like go on this ride and, and be here for every episode, kind of expecting it to play out in a certain way. And this episode, you know, plays out in a I, I really enjoyed how. Um, this episode being the second episode, seeing Loki go to the library and have to do the research really on all fun. the things. I love and both like, of those sequences. The little like seven callback also where he's going through the library and they're mm -hmm. playing the classical music from yeah. when Morgan Freeman is like in the library in seven. I mm -hmm. nerded out about that. Um, so it was fun to kind of settle into that mode of, okay, we're going to watch a detective story where every week they're going to uncover clues and it's going to be really fun. But then like you're saying, by the end of this episode, it feels like that's all been turned upside down. And, you know, the reveal of, uh, you know, Lady Loki or whatever we want to, mm -hmm. you know, other Loki um, was interesting, but more interesting was that Loki follows her into the gateway. And so Within one episode, it felt like it's set up for me. Okay, now I know what the show is. And then it like inverted that. And now I have no idea, like you're saying, Trisha, what the next episode could, could possibly be. Well, my instinct, and I hope I'm wrong, is that they will immediately get him back and they will immediately go back to the thing that we, you know, the model that you sort of just described of like, you know, he, they catch him again. And he's like, no, no, I was just, I was trying to get undercover. And, mm -hmm. you know, within the first five, 10 minutes of the next episode, I hope that's not how it goes. Uh, but I feel like that would create that continuity that you're talking about. And it's a possibility. Yeah. They might do that, you know, but we'll see. Yeah. I, I think the thing that works dramatically about this and WandaVision in particular is uh, when we interviewed the um, the writers of Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order, we talked about what was called the Rogue One problem mm. of when you're doing a prequel set in this universe, basically, if the good guys don't succeed, then the move, the original trilogy doesn't exist or it doesn't exist. So it's like the good guys have to succeed in order for nothing to happen, basically. And that <laughs> right. can be disappointing mm -hmm. as an audience because you know that that's kind of how it's going to end. But it's sort of a fun, it, it, it still creates like a, like a weird tension, but it's a, it's a problem. And I think what's cool about both WandaVision and Loki is we know they're setting up a world thing 
but we don't know what that world thing is. So in WandaVision, it, the, the constant conversation I was having with myself was, is this a, a show about Wanda accepting Vision's death? Or is this a show about Wanda getting Vision back to life? And so either one could work, you know, and it's, it is a weird thing of like, if it's about her accepting his death, then we didn't need the entire show in terms of plot stuff. We need the show for character stuff, obviously, you know, but we don't, it doesn't actually change anything in the, in the bigger universe. But if we brought vision back, then holy crap, now there's this huge like change that's happened. And I think we have kind of a similar thing here where it's not telling us what we're going to get. Are we going to get Loki? sort of basically Loki has seen that he has to be evil and like kill, you know, like do all this bad stuff in order for time to work. But our hero who is the vil- the better villain than the show's villain, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> uh, he doesn't want that. He wants to actually be more good, at least more good than, you know, <laughs> Ragnarok good and not <laughs> right. like not Thor right. good or not Avengers, uh, you know, bad. Um, but we don't know what he's going to get. Are they going to bring, uh, you know, the character back at the end of this or are they not? And that gives us a dramatic question to sort of hang on to both for the show itself, but also in the bigger picture. Or is he going to be the next Bond? Because he's clearly auditioning for it with all these suits. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, speaking of James Bond, my my immediate meta thought about all of this was a multiverse is a great way to cast other actors as characters that we know and love. Yeah. And get to continue using the characters that we know and love while not having to keep the actors under contract if they don't want to be or if mm-hmm. you can't afford them anymore. Um, so that was, you know, Falcon and the Winter Soldier. They were like, here's the shield whoever has it is captain america now like yeah. i mean you're doing the thing you're you're protecting your characters so you can keep printing money using <laughs> these characters that kids love um and hang on, hang on i just got a text from alex he says yeah products <laughs> <laughs> how, did he, how did he how did he know, how did he know that? that's impressive that's a superhuman hearing um <laughs> yeah that's a that's a cynical way to look at it, but it's also smart, mm-hmm. right? If you're in charge of the battleship that is the MCU, like it's smart to try to keep characters that everybody loves. So you're keeping people invested, right? You know, we often talk about the sort of money grab things and we don't like that when it grates on us for whatever reason, when it oversteps its bounds, Mm -hmm. right? But we Mm -hmm. usually are pretty forgiving if it tends to be about characters that we really care about. And in Loki's case, it's smart. Loki, we love him. So first of all, having a show about Loki, already a smart move in the first place. But then introducing sort of multiverse kind of Lokis, maybe we will love Lady Loki by the end. You know, Mm -hmm. maybe she will be this or... You know, I've heard rumors that she's actually this other character from the comics. Mm -hmm. Um, But either way, maybe we'll get to see her again in future properties and and everything. And if we really do care about her, if they can create, you know, some empathy from us or just some interest and delight, that would be enough. And that might not necessarily feel like the soulless money grab that we don't like (laughs) Mm -hmm. when it creeps into our large franchises. Yeah, I mean, like... Endgame does not feel like a movie where they're they're going, oh, well, we clearly had to write out these two big actors who con- whose contracts were up. Exactly. It feels like a very emotional farewell to right. these characters. It may be on a meta level for for contractual reasons and stuff like that, but it doesn't matter as long as the writing is, is there, you know? Yep. Yeah, and I think that's why the MCU works for me overall, is that mm-hmm. there does feel like there's love happening along with give yeah. us the money. Like, and I feel like they understand (laughs) that that's kind of their relationship with their fans is like, right. They have to deliver on some level that, that thing in order for the money to keep happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that one of the ways that the MCU does that particularly well is by somehow bridging the gap between fantasy and sort of more grounded, like character stuff. And I've talked about this before. Um, I think I talked about it in our Infinity War and Endgame episode and just about 
how the Marvel characters are really human. And mm-hmm. the Loki is a really good example of that. You have two characters who absolutely are not human, but the way that they speak to each other and interact and their insecurities about who they are and what their destiny is and you know what the future holds for them. Like, do you enjoy causing pain to others? This is a conversation about bullying, mm-hmm. right? That's a very human conversation that Loki and Mobius end up having. And it does it, it's in this fantastical world, but the the humanness of it is always really present. And the MCU does that particularly well. And they also do it, you know, a lot of people have pointed out that the MCU gets away with some self-awareness about mm-hmm. like being a superhero is ridiculous. And that is true. That's kind of baked into the characters from early on in the history of the comics. But the fact that the MCU totally continues to do that today, I think is another reason. So I love the conversation that they're having where he's like, you know, who made you? The the time lizards, the time keepers? And he's like, well, yeah. And he's like, well, don't you understand how ridiculous you sound? Who made you? Well, an ice giant. You know, it's <laughs> right. Right. They're they're able to hang lanterns on the absurdity in a way that still that is endearing for one, but also creates that sort of grounded human feeling to it where otherwise it would just it really wouldn't work if they played it totally straight. Right. Right. If they didn't acknowledge the the weirdness of or the just, you know, right. laughability of being a superhero or whatever. Yeah, I I feel like I've two kind of thoughts that branch from that. One of which is that I I do think the self-awareness has gotten them very far. But personally, I'm feeling like maybe Mm. the mileage that they're getting out of it has has run its course, where there's just a little bit too much of that Mm -hmm. for me, where I'm like, okay, yeah, I know that you know, and I know that you know that I know. So let's (laughs) do something new now is my thought on the the self-awareness thing yeah quick addition to that is yeah i always think of the there's a line in age of ultron where hawkeye is like i think comforting wanda and he's and he says something like look there's a bunch of robots chasing us and i have a bow and arrow like i, well, I don't know what the hell's <laughs> going on and it's that sort of you know age of ultron they let joss whedon be full joss whedon which nobody wants um <laughs> but um but so it's that kind of line where i'm like oh i appreciate that because of everything you were just saying trisha of like i feel now like i am not alienated i feel like i am sort of being brought in like look we know it's silly but like have fun with us um but there's also as you were saying michael there's part of me that's sort of waiting for the mcu to implode uh for for me personally where i'm just like when they're multiverse like craziness and then portals open up and now all the x-men are here or something like that i'm just waiting for the moment where i'm like okay that you've gone you've gone too far but like they made it all the way to end game without that happening for me and that's really impressive so i'm I'm very curious what's going to happen but every time i see the like list of all the shows coming out i'm just like all right i don't know we'll see <laughs> so so yeah i think that they're walking a very like they're walking a tightrope between those things definitely yeah. and i think it doesn't work as well in shows like falcon and the winter soldier where they're talking about like oh we have to go fight these wizards or right what, you know, what is that line about the big, the big, the big three? three yeah right yeah oh, a sorcerer yeah. is a wizard without a hat yeah see <laughs> yeah. that does not work as well because that show is trying to be so grounded right, right? it's trying right. to be like it's all military technology and the super soldiers that's science like it's science and it's you know engineering as opposed to this where it's like well i'm using my magic to dry my clothes so i'm not squeaking on the floor of this mm-hmm. futuristic department store it's like yeah right. okay that I think it works a little bit better in certain contexts. Right. In Thor, they had they wrote the line because my thinking of the first, you know, six, eight movies was how are they going to combine all these very different tonal things? Right. Thor and Iron Man and that kind of thing. So they had a line, I think, in Thor or maybe Avengers where he says what you, you know, we've always called science magic before we've understood it kind of thing. Mm-hmm. You know, like what, what you call magic, we call science. And then you get to Loki, where they literally just refer to it as magic powers. <laughs> like yeah. you can't use right. magic like, here. No magic. Like, yeah. We're on we're on Hogwarts grounds. Like yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. My my last thought is that I I think there is potential in this multiverse path because you know coming into Endgame and and walking out of Endgame, I felt this um, awe of what they had accomplished and like wow you got to the ending and you stuck the ending. Yep. This should be the ending, but there are so many more things coming. So how are you going to handle that? And I think that 
I don't know that multiverse is the solution, but I feel like if there is a solution, it's probably that. It's yeah. like rather than go forward, we're going to take a left turn into bonkers world where we can have fun and play with which superheroes are back and are we going to see people that played Spider-Man in the other movies show mm-hmm. up and like all of that stuff like I think if you're going to have this keep going just completely turning it and letting the 21 arc you know movie arc or whatever it was let that be and don't try to go further into the future is my personal feeling on it so I'm curious to see what this multiverse of of madness leads us to mm. Right. Yeah. It's interesting as a sort of casual Marvel fan, but as a bigger Star Wars fan, it's like with Star Wars, I feel like, no, I want you to do this and please don't do that. With Marvel, I'm kind of more just like, ah, do whatever you want. Let's have fun. Go crazy. But I also appreciate that there are Marvel fans, especially comic fans who who don't want that, you know, and, and they feel very protective of their stuff. I remember once I saw a comment, I think when Love and Thunder, uh, the next Thor movie was announced, there was a comment that said like, like, uh, Taika, you know, this movie's going to be terrible. Taika took Thor and turned it, uh, turned him into a cartoon character. And I said, this movie's going to be awesome. Taika took Thor and turned him into a cartoon character. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was like, sure. I had the exact same, like, exact same words to, to, to have a very different opinion about something. Because I was like, I don't feel so protective of this that I, so I'm happy for a Ragnarok to exist, right? right? But I also appreciate that there are people who are like, no, no, no. I feel this certain way about these things and they are dear to me. So the more silly you get with them and the more playful you get with them, the more I feel like you're, you're taking it away from me, you know? Um, so yeah, it'll just be interesting to track how, how it's all going as it goes. Yeah. yeah. I, not to dive too much into the star Wars Marvel comparison, but I just do think that there's a big difference between like a space opera that took place over 30 years worth of time. And they only made, you know, a handful of movies and and now they're trying to like right expand it out and everything versus something like this that was made within a relatively short amount of time in the 21st century right and it has kind of always been guided by the same more or less creative minds and in one direction more or less and so i think that not that one position is more valid than the other in terms of what feels sacred to you and what doesn't feel sacred to you. Whatever feels sacred to you is fine. Um, I just think that Marvel didn't have to do as much legwork right. as creators of new Star Wars things had to do to try to not step on something sacred. Right. They also started out the MCU with Iron Man and Thor and Captain America Correct. and uh, Incredible Hulk. So it's like right off the bat, they're like, look, these movies are going to be different. They are going to feel different. And, that and there's going to be them... a lot more of them. <laughs> and there's going to be a lot more. <laughs> yeah. Right. So we don't have to be precious with things when there's always more things <laughs> right. coming right. down the line, which is sad and just reality at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, well, and we can, when we do our What is Star Wars episode, we can dive all the way into that. (laughs) Um, Awesome. Well, so this has been the beginning of our conversation on Loki. I feel like we talked about a lot of like big picture context things. And so I'm excited to, in the next episodes, dive into the more week to week, what's happening in each episode. Very curious what happens now that Loki's gone through this magic door. Mm -hmm. Uh, And we'll save all of our lessons for the end of the series and then we okay. can do our big takeaways of like what what are the lessons we're going to take from loki um what have you guys been watching recently brian tell me about what you've been watching uh so i watched the second season of netflix's love death and robots um oh, how which was is, it? uh, it's good there i mean it's hard to say like how is any season of this show because every episode is just its own thing so it's a series of animated sci-fi shorts that are um it's created by Tim Miller and David Fincher. And they basically, as far as I can tell, they just sort of give people free reign to go make their own thing. And then they put it out as a series. So you get these weird, wild, adult uh, CG sci-fi shorts, very, you know, R-rated. There's lots of CG penis. If that's if that's your thing, get into it. Um, hmm. <laughs> and uh, and yeah, the episodes are anywhere from five to 20 minutes. So any given episode isn't a huge investment. If you're like not feeling it or something, I mean, you could just stop an episode, but also there's only 10 minutes left. Just wait and then you can watch the next one. So it's just a really cool um, 
I, I like this as a format. It's just a grab bag of these stories that sort of don't really speak to each other at all. They're just these. It's it's a way to it's it's a way to show short films, which we don't get to do that much. Short films are sort of this nebulous thing that don't exist anywhere, and mm-hmm. it's hard because people there are a lot of good short films out there that don't get seen. Um, so this is a nice way to have a bunch that are sort of thematically connected and kind of tonally connected, but some are really dark and some are really comic and stuff, but it sort of all feels like the same thing. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I just, I recommend checking it out. And if you, if you're not digging an episode, just go to the next one because they're <laughs> just all different and they're all their own little stories. And, uh, I think John Scalzi, who's a famous, um, sci-fi, uh, author, he wrote the first episode of the first of the the new season. Um, so, you know, they're actually getting like some, some big hitters involved and that kind of thing. So yeah, it's fun. Nice. Awesome. I've been meaning to watch it. This is maybe the push I needed to actually mm-hmm. press play. Trisha, what have you been watching? Yeah, so I managed to get out and see In the Heights. Oh. And what a joy. What a joy it is. <laughs> like, I am a big musical fan and a great big old, you know, singing, dancing, hugely produced like uplifting musical is I want nothing more than that. And that's what in the Heights is. And um, it's really cool. A lot of people have pointed out that, and this is true that it's a very clever approach to a Broadway show where it feels like the film is using all of the tools of film. They're not just filming a Broadway play. They're doing really interesting, cinematic, highly visual, you know, some special effectsy stuff, but but really just like really using the medium to its full advantage to capture sort of the spirit of of the musical. Um, so it's really great, amazing performances, wonderful dancing, like hmm. uh, really really great dance sequences. Obviously, the music is very snappy and upbeat, and and <laughs> just if you love a big summer, it's very summer because it's set in the summer and it's all about you know people's dreams in New York City and. It's great. That's what that's what I want. So um, In the Heights is just a lot of fun. Definitely recommend. Very cool. Awesome. Yeah, I also need to check that out. Uh, in a completely different direction, I watched Primal Fear recently. Yay! Uh, wow! Which is uh, a 1996 film with Richard Gere and Laura Linney, and it definitely feels like a 1996 film. And there's lawyers... And Richard Gere is kind of creepy and like Is it a sleazy. law, like a legal thriller? Yeah, it's like, okay. a, it's like court, it, it feels kind of like um, A Few Good Men, but like more Hollywood, like mm-hmm. less like dialogue, snappy talking and more chase sequences through like homeless shelters underneath bridges from the lawyer. Okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and more of a dark tone, like not quite seven, but sort of somewhere between a few good men and seven, put it, put it that way. Right. Like reaching more for like, you know, humans, the dark nature of humanity right. uh-huh. um, through the lens of 1996 filmmaking. I don't know. It was like, it was really fascinating. And I feel like uh, people that have never seen a lawyer thriller from the nineties should watch it. Uh-huh. Yes. Cause I think it's just, they was made like a such bunch a of them, right? Yeah, there, there's a whole subgenre of them out there, and this this is a fascinating. Laura Linney is great, also. How? I mean, Laura she's awesome. always great, but she's yes. very great in this. And, also, Edward yeah. Norton's first performance and first Oscar nomination. And Francis McDormand is in it. Also, the cast is crazy. Mm. Everybody's great. Yikes. Uh, super weird. Primal Fear. Okay, check it out. So yeah, this has been our conversation about the first two episodes of Loki. If you want to hear more of this miniseries, you can support us on Patreon. Just head over to patreon.com slash beyond the screenplay or click the link in the show notes. We want to say a big thank you, as always, to the patrons that make this show possible. We want to say thank you to our producer, Vince Major, and our editor, Eric Schneider. I'm Michael Tucker. I've been joined today by Trisha Rand and Brian Bittner. Alex Kairos is off on vacation, not watching MCU things. All of our Twitter (laughs) handles are in the show notes. Send us a tweet, say hi, and we will see you in the next episode. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.